to Dynasty 365, where the film will set you free. I apologize for my absence last weekend. I got pretty sick, and then my back seized up due to dehydration from being sick. So remember when I was talking about how much foot injuries can affect the rest of your body? Well, they really do. But I am working on fixing my production timeline so that I can prevent issues like this in the future. This is a learning experience for myself. I've never started a year-round Dynasty podcast before, so there are going to be hiccups, but I'm always trying to improve and increase efficiency so that you, can win Dynasty Championships. Today, we're going to go over the news from Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So it's going to be a long segment. And then we'll talk about Jay Sternberger's situation on the Packers, how Jay Sternberger, the tight end, looks as a prospect, and then my verdict on where he should be selected in your rookie drafts. For your much overdue NFL news, Jameis Winston said that second-year running back Ronald Jones has been showing out at OTAs. So it's good to see that last year's second-round pick is doing better. I did expect him to take a little bit of time to transition to the NFL, but I still do believe in his talent and believe that Jones will become the starter this year. Depending on how he performs, the Bucks may address running back in next year's draft, but I do think Jones is going to develop into a good NFL player. Hopefully you didn't sell too low, and hopefully you bought low during the offseason. Yahoo reports that the league is likely going to review Zeke Elliott's Las Vegas incident, which is not surprising. After watching the video, I do think he's going to get some sort of suspension, especially with his past suspension. I wouldn't expect it to be anything more than two games, but it's always a guess with the NFL and their punishment structure. Rashad Perryman, wide receiver for the Buccaneers, apparently has been sidelined since he hurt his shoulder two weeks ago, which is odd because I heard a lot of buzz that he was showing out at Bucks practice, but if he hasn't been playing for two weeks, when did he exactly do that? Underwhelming tight end for the Bears, Trey Burton is going to miss the rest of the offseason program with a sports hernia surgery. He should be back by week one in training camp, so it's not a huge issue. But if you are relying on him as your starter, you should probably start making some moves or invest into some of the quality rookie tight ends available this year. Maybe even Jay Sternberger. Colt safety Clayton Gathers is going to be sidelined until training camp following a knee scope. He has been injured a lot and is probably not going to be playing a lot of quality snaps this year. Dante Foreman, running back for the Texans, says that he feels as healthy as he ever has dating back to college. Two years ago, he tore his Achilles as a rookie and wasn't fully recovered last season. A lot of the reports are that he does look good and he looks healthy. And if that's true, he's probably going to, at worst, split time with Lamar Miller. But the Achilles injury is a historically difficult one to overcome for running backs. If Foreman or Miller goes down during camp, Karan Higdon is a must-add in all formats. In IDP news, Lane Vander Esch, standout rookie linebacker for the Cowboys last season, still isn't doing OTA work with a pelvis injury, but he is expected to participate in training camp. No big news there, just something to keep an eye on if you own him. Packers running back Aaron Jones, who we're going to get into in more detail in today's episode, reported to the team with 5.3% body fat, which was 11% at this time last year. He's apparently worked on his strength and conditioning and improved his diet in order to try and remain healthy after a week 14 ACL tear last season. 
A player I've always had my eye on, Chris Moore, wide receiver for the Ravens, was talked up by the Ravens owner as a breakout candidate, which is possible, but at this point, Chris Moore probably just pretty much is what he is. He's a good complimentary receiver and great special teams player, and unless something drastic changes or the rookies aren't ready, that's probably where he'll remain for fantasy and dynasty purposes. The Ravens owner also said that Lamar Jackson won't be running 20 times a game, which he averaged 17 rushes per game last year, so that's a pretty safe assumption, and this is more of a non-news story than anything else, as of course Lamar Jackson is going to continue to run, that's his best attribute, and if his passing mechanics aren't improved enough yet, the head coach is going to be making that decision, not the owner. The Jaguars signed wide receiver Terrell Pryor, who had a good year with the Browns in 2016, but has not looked good since. If you have him and can sell him to someone else, do it by all means, as I highly doubt he's ever going to be fantasy relevant again. Good news for Tevin Coleman, running back of the Niners, as he said he's lining up at wide receiver more than he did in Atlanta. If you're in a PPR format, this is huge news, but I've never been too high on Tevin Coleman and do think he's going to continue to split carries with McKinnon and Breda, but he's definitely the favorite to lead that team in fantasy points this year. And this is just good news that it won't be a standard league scoring format only affair, but that's expected with how the 49ers have used their running backs with with Shanahan at the helm. Redskins running back Chris Thompson said he's feeling as healthy as he's been in a while, but Thompson has a crazy long injury history and is never healthy for too long. He's definitely way more of a redraft fantasy asset than dynasty, but if he is out there in your waiver wire for some unknown reason or you need some RB depth, sending a late pick to try to acquire him is not the worst idea in the world. So now Deion Kane, wide receiver for the Colts, has had a complete turnaround in his injury news as they're now saying that he's supposed to be ready for training camp. This is a journalist saying this, while the general manager said that he's not close to 100%, and normally I would side with the general manager, but the journalist does say that he's already sprinting, cutting, and running routes, which would be pretty huge, and mark him as on track to recover by training camp. If he's healthy, that definitely puts more of a damper on Paris Campbell, but I had Paris Campbell way higher rated as a receiver coming out of college, so it's still not that worrying. In IDP news, defensive end Tack McKinley for the Falcons has apparently been taking some reps at linebacker, so this could be huge if you have defensive line spots in your league and he starts playing linebacker and getting tackles from that position. Now, I'm not sure exactly how their defense is going to be structured, but if he is playing a stand-up, three yards off the ball type of linebacker role and you can slot him in at defensive end, much like may happen with rookie Josh Allen of the Jaguars, that's a cheat code that you should exploit. Always look for cheat codes when you're trying to find dynasty players. This would be a cheat code. In Texans news that you can use to acquire Kahale Boring, Jordan Thomas is working as the number one tight end at Texans OTAs, which is no shock as he already knows the system and has been in it a year. I still have zero doubt that Kahale Boring is going to be involved early and often in the passing game in Houston. He's by far the most polished receiver that they have in the tight end room, and he's a rookie. He just has a natural feel for playing tight end and helping out his quarterback in great hands. So if you use this news to go get Kahali Waring cheaper than where he was drafted, that would be a huge win, but I have no problem selling a second round pick for Kahali. The Bears' second year offensive lineman James Daniels is now going to be working at center, which was his college position. Much like we talked about with Frank Ragnow, he played guard last year and now is moving to his preferred position of center. That should increase the run game prowess if Daniels is up to the task, but with young players, that's always a gamble. Ravens wide receiver Miles Boykin is out with a hamstring injury and unable to participate in OTAs. This definitely lowers the chance that he's a week one starter as there's a lot to learn, both to learn the playbook and to refine his technique as much as possible before the season starts, but hopefully this does not linger like the Cranberries. 
The Chiefs offensive coordinator said that Damian Williams will be the team's starting running back, which of course he should say at this point in the year based on how Williams was the lead guy last year, but he does have much more competition for touches with the addition of Carlos Hyde, who has declined but is no slouch when he's healthy, Darwin Thompson, and James Williams to that backfield. But if you own him, it's good to know that he's going to get the first shot. If you have him, ideally in week one and two, if a contending team or a possible contending team has a starting running back get injured, you can probably squeeze a first round or second round pick for Williams if he's been playing well, which he should, but I do not think his tenure as the lead back of the Chiefs is going to last more than this season, if that. The Seahawks have sued their old second rounder Malik McDowell to recover $800,000 in his signing bonus. He famously got injured in an ATV accident over the summer before he even played a snap, and I don't think he ever did play a snap. He is only 23, but he's got such character red flags that I will be surprised if he's ever relevant for IDP purposes. In more Ravens wide receiver news, Willie Sneed has lost 10 pounds this year in order to try and get more separation and speed. He definitely was a favorite of Lamar Jackson last year and would be a very sneaky add at a cheap price to your dynasty team if you need some more help at receiver, but probably will be overtaken by one of the rookies at some point in the next couple years. Darren Sproul said that he may play this year in the NFL, but his best days are behind him, and he's constantly injured. One of the best scat backs of all time. It's sad to see his run come to an end, but I'd rather have him get out now than risk further injury. Even if he does say he's going to play, unless he lands in an elite offense like the Chiefs, he's probably safe to stay on the waiver wire. Apparently, cornerback Adoree Jackson of the Titans is recovering from lower body surgery but moving well. As I preach time and time again, any injury below the shin worries me. So if you own him, monitor this situation carefully and inspect his movement during the preseason. Quarterback Cam Newton of the Panthers has resumed throwing a regulation-sized football. This is a great sign, as Andrew Luck didn't even start throwing a regulation-sized ball last year until partway through training camp, and hopefully the shoulder injury scare makes Cam Newton think a little more about improving his mechanics to avoid injury and to extend his career. If you are holding on to Will Greer in a Superflex and you don't own Cam Newton, I would try to be selling him before that owner realizes that Newton will likely be back this year, and I also had Will Greer as my last ranked quarterback of the quarterbacks I scouted pre-draft, so I would be trying to get out from under him sooner rather than later. Linebacker Reuben Foster of the Redskins tore his LCL as well as his ACL when he went down last week. At the time, I told you to try and trade for him with a late round pick. As I know, as a personal owner of Foster, he has been nothing but a disappointment as he's barely played since he was drafted. But this is easily an injury that he can come back from. The key piece of news here is that he did not suffer any artery damage. I know that it's very rare for artery damage to happen alongside an ACL tear, and that was why I was willing to risk a pick to acquire his services and wait on him for a year. If you did follow my advice, kudos to you. Even now, you still can probably get him for a later pick, and I still would do so. But his price probably is higher right now than when it was feared that he had artery damage as that possibly could have ended his career on the spot. Tight end Jack Doyle of the Colts has begun cutting, and he's recovering from hip and kidney injuries. He's never been much of a runner, but he does have sure hands, and will suck targets out of that passing game if he is healthy. He's a low upside player, but a player that can bridge your tight end woes if you need him. Head coach Doug Marone of the Jaguars said that Josh Oliver, rookie tight end out of San Diego State, I believe, has been a standout at OTAs. He complimented the rookie's catch radius and blocking technique, and unless this is a different Josh Oliver, he must have worked his fucking ass off improving his blocking technique because he had the single worst blocking technique and desire to block of any tight end in this draft. He does look like a receiver when he's out there, so I could see him being one of those sneaky tight ends that essentially plays wide receiver and is never asked to block, but just the fact that he complimented his blocking technique is super odd to me. He has no competition on that team at the tight end position for targets, but it all depends on him and how fast he can translate. He's got a top three, four, five opportunity score out of these rookie tight ends, so he's definitely a dart throw that you could take. 
I simply don't give a shit about the Jets GM job until it's actually filled, and even then we're probably not going to know who that person is, so I'm not getting into it. Same with Gerald McCoy, I don't care until he signs with the team. In your IDP news, Hassan Reddick, linebacker for the Cardinals, is going to work exclusively at inside linebacker this season. If you are still holding on to him, this is the best possible news you could hear, but I don't think he has very good instincts. Defensive coordinator and former shitty Broncos head coach Vance Joseph said that his better years are ahead of him, and you can see it happening right now. It almost has to be, as he only got 53 tackles last year on the team that probably saw the most offensive snaps play against them in the NFL. He's still a candidate to have a late breakout, but after a certain point in time, you have to start producing. So he's someone to monitor. I would not pick him up based off this news. If I owned him, I'd actually try to be selling him using this news quote. In far more relevant IDP news, Quan Alexander, the new linebacker of the Niners, is supposed to be ready for a training camp after tearing his ACL in last October. And if he is healthy, he's most likely going to be a top 10 linebacker in the NFL based on their scheme and the overall weakness of the rest of their defense. Tight end Delaney Walker of the Titans and Mariota's favorite target has been cleared for 7-on-7 drills at OTAs. Again, he hurt his ankle last year in pretty horrific fashion, so it's good to see that he can at least move around, but for probably the 78th time, injuries that low on the body on that big of a man always scare me, so keep watching him and pay attention. In relevant news for tomorrow's episode about Daryl Henderson, the Rams general manager Les Snead said that Gurley is unlikely to play in the preseason. I'll agree with Roto World here, this isn't a surprise. And as we'll get to more in tomorrow's episode, I think the fear of his knee injury is getting a little out of control. Often injured Ravens running back Kenneth Dixon has been sitting out OTAs with an undisclosed injury and almost certainly is going to be cut from this squad in training camp after all the bodies they added at the running back position in the offseason. And Dixon's inability to stay healthy or off of PEDs since he's entered the league. Since we're going over like five days here, Miles Boykin is already maybe recovered from that hamstring injury that he had four minutes ago. So they're saying he's getting close to returning. It wasn't considered serious, which is great news if you snagged him in your rookie draft. As we mentioned on the situational breakdown with him and Marquise Brown, and also in my wide receiver breakdowns, his blocking ability will likely help him see a lot of snaps just for that, as the Ravens are still going to be a run first team. In even more Ravens wide receiver news, Marquise Brown, who's recovering from his Liz Frank injury, is targeting a return at training camp. Again, this is going to put him behind the curve in developing as a rookie. Liz Frank injuries are always scary, even more scary than other foot-related injuries. So we'll see with Marquise Brown. I'm already on the record as saying what I think about him. If you want to know, go look up the old episodes. If you're in a deeper IDP league and need some defensive end help, that is a name, Tack McKinley. Defensive end Charles Harris is a former first-round pick, and the first-year head coach Brian Flores says he's the kind of guy we want. He's smart, hardworking, and he's got a lot of ability. The Dolphins lost Robert Quinn and Cameron Wake in the offseason, so at worst, he could gobble up some tackles, even if he doesn't get the sack numbers you're looking for. But if you need some end-of-bench depth at the defensive line or defensive end position, he's a name to at least to look for. Colt safety Malik Hooker claims he's the healthiest he's been since college. This is always the time of the year where everyone's healthy and everyone's in the best shape of their life, and he has had a lot of injury issues since he's been in the league, but he could be IDP relevant if he can play 16. The Dolphins would prefer to trade safety Rashad Jones, which makes sense as he's 31 years old and has a $17 million cap hit. The problem is the way safeties are valued today in the league, it's going to be hard to find a willing suitor. But this is a guy to watch for IDP purposes as he has shown ability and he could find himself on a bad team that has the room to absorb that cap hit. But we'll see. This is an interesting trade if it does happen. Rob Gronkowski said, I'm feeling good. I'm in a good place when asked about his retirement, so he's probably not coming back anytime soon. But if they do have injuries early in New England, it is possible that we see Gronk in a uniform this year. Bruce Arians said the Buccaneer secondary is totally fixed, which is ridiculous bullshit and one of those things that you really need to see to believe. So we'll see. I really highly doubt it. No secondary is pretty much ever totally fixed, but maybe he's just trying to instill confidence in his young secondary players. 
It's being reported that A.J. Brown will likely play a majority of his snaps outside. We went over this in his breakdown, and it's mainly because they signed slot receiver Adam Humphreys, and that's where he's going to play. A.J. Brown was already destined for the slot in the NFL, in my opinion, so him being pushed to the perimeter isn't a good sign for first-year production on the second-least pass-happy team in the entire NFL. Bills rookie tight end Dawson Knox has already impressed, which is good. Apparently, he looks fast, which he is. And quarterback Josh Allen praised his familiarity with the playbook. That's a huge sign. Tight ends have a ridiculous amount of responsibilities and a very complex playbook. So it's good to see that he can figure out that aspect. We'll see how Tyler Croft looks when he comes back from his broken foot, but that's not a good sign that he got injured that early with a foot injury. But Knox is in the same camp as Oliver and Warren and Fant and Hawkinson in where they have pretty weak depth charts in front of them to see immediate playing time. I did have problems with Knox as a player on film, but he did show some good traits, so he's definitely worth a dart throw, but he's probably gobbled up by this point after the Tyler Croft news broke. That's it for the news today. Now let's talk about the situation that Jay Sternberger finds himself in on the Packers. At wide receiver, they've got Devontae Adams, who is going to be 27 by season's end next season. He's a contested catcher plus with the ability to run more routes than just make contested catches. And he reached a new level last season with no realistic number two pass catcher in that offense after Geronimo Allison got injured. He played 15 games in 2018 with 169 targets, which is 11.3 per game, 111 catches, 1,386 yards, and 13 touchdowns. Touchdowns. This led to 13 yards per route, 8 yards per target, 13 yards per touch, and a 66% catch rate. His three-year average is 136 targets at 9 a game, 87 catches, 1,089 yards, 12 touchdowns, and a 64% catch rate. He's only played 16 games once in his five-year career, but he has only missed three total games in the past three years. He'll continue to be a touchdown magnet in 2019 and should get numbers similar to last season. Geronimo Allison will be 25 and is a deep threat with the ability to run multiple routes. He's never played 16 games and he was the clear number two for the Packers during their first five games last season. In that time frame, he acquired 30 targets, which is six per game average, 20 catches, 303 yards, two touchdowns with 15 yards per route, 10 yards per target, 15 yards per touch, and a 67% catch rate. If he would have been healthy for 16 games, that pace would have resulted in 96 targets. 64 catches, 970 yards, and 6 touchdowns. He's a solid yet unspectacular player that I do believe will remain the number 2 target in this offense until one of the rookies from last year, or a tight end, proves to earn Rodgers' trust. At only 25, there's plenty of upside in this cheap dynasty player to produce this season and for a few years. He's almost exclusively an outside receiver, but I have heard rumors of him seeing more time in the slot with the departure of often injured Randall Cobb. Marquez Valdez-Scantling is also turning 25 this year, and he's a deep threat that does have the agility to possibly play in the slot. He's entering his second year, and he had a decent five-game run right after Allison got injured, but he lost the trust of Rodgers and only caught more than two passes twice in the final seven games. He did get 100 yards twice, but he didn't see any more playing time until Green Bay was knocked out of the playoff picture. Last year, he played 16 games, starting 10, accruing 73 targets, targets for 4.6 per game, 38 catches, 581 yards, and two touchdowns. He averaged 15 yards per route, 8 yards per target, 15 yards per touch, and a 52% catch rate in his rookie year. I could easily see his snap share going up as he's a natural fit for the slot, but his efficiency and rapport with Rodgers must improve if he's going to hold off Equinemius St. Brown, who is two years younger at 23. ESB saw action in 12 games last year and started 7, and in that time, he received 36 targets, or 3 per game, 21 catches, 328 yards, but no touchdowns, and averaged 16 yards per route, 9 yards per target, 15 yards per touch, and a 58% catch rate. I had him much higher ranked than Marquez Valdez-Scantling coming out of college, as many did, and I could easily see him usurping both MVS and Geronimo with improved hands and route running. He's got all the 
physical tools you could ever ask for in a wide receiver with great speed and agility in a six foot five frame but his slip in the draft pointing to some character issues and he's also had a lot of issues with drops if you are looking for a high upside stash play in the Packers receiving core it is Equinemius St. Brown due to his younger age and tremendous top level potential The Packers also got Jamon Moore last year, who will be 24 this year, and was the highest drafted of the Packers' now four second-year wideouts they have on their team. Moore did almost nothing in his rookie year, seeing just three targets for two receptions and 15 yards. While it remains a possibility that he could develop further, my money is on Drew Locke making him look better than he really is on his college film. The rest of the receivers are Jags and unlikely to see much time, but Alan Lazard, Trevor Davis, and Jake Kumaro have all received hype at some point in the past two seasons. At tight end, the Packers have 33-year-old Jimmy Graham, who is entering his 10th season overall and his second as a Green Bay Packer. In 2018, the original Jimmy G received 89 targets, or 5.6 per game, for just 55 catches, 636 yards, and two touchdowns. This led to 12 yards per route, 7 yards per target, 12 yards per touch, with a 62% catch rate. No longer the matchup nightmare he was with the Saints, injuries have sapped his playmaking ability, namely a torn Teller tendon in 2015. He also fractured his thumb last year towards the end of the season, sprained his AC joint, which is his shoulder, in 2014, suffered a grade one tear of his plantar fascia in 2013, which is the bottom of his foot, and the year before, he dislocated a finger, suffered a grade two low ankle sprain, and sprained his wrist. Rodgers has never been correlated with tight end fantasy stardom, and Graham probably won't buck the trend as he ages. He signed through 2020 by the Packers, but will likely be released following this season as his dead cap number decreases 73% to $3.7 million. Behind Graham, they've got Robert Tunyon, who's entering his 25-year-old season and third year in the NFL as a former undrafted free agent. Originally, he was signed out of college by the Detroit Lions, picked up by the Packers in late 2017 after he was cut from the team. While he only started one game last season, he played in all 16 in a special teams capacity, and I liked what I saw out of him in the preseason last year. He did only receive six targets last season, catching four for 77 yards, one touchdown, and a 67% catch rate. With Jimmy Graham still in town and the drafting of Jay Sternberger, he looks to remain a special teams player, but he is a good pass catcher who I think challenges Sternberger more than people are currently thinking. If he can improve his blocking this year and continue to produce in the preseason, this could be a name that ends up as a thorn in the side of Sternberger owners. At running back, the Packers have Aaron Jones, who will be 25 and took a step forward last season and emerged as a clear difference maker for the Packers. McCarthy's refusal to give him touches in what should have been an easy blowout win against the Cardinals directly led to his firing, but McCarthy had been underutilizing the run game infamously throughout his tenure. Jones has great vision, acceleration, agility, contact balance, and tenacity to get the tough yards. He reportedly has improved his body composition in a bid to stay healthy as he's only completed 12 games each in his two seasons to date. He's also capable in the passing game and the easy favorite to lead the team in touches in 2019. Last year, he rushed 133 times for 728 yards and a 5.5 yards per carry average, reaching the end zone eight times. In the receiving game, he saw only 35 targets, 2.9 per game, catching 26 passes for 206 yards, one touchdown, and a 74% catch rate. I fully expect Jones to see heavier usage this season, especially with a coach known for the run, and I am excited by the reports that he's treating his body better and that he's in good shape following an ACL tear in week 14 last season. That ACL tear also knocked me out of my redraft league playoffs, partially. I probably would have lost anyways, having a horrible week, but that definitely didn't help. Behind Jones, they've got Jamal Williams, who is 24 and has been the sleeper pick of that backfield for the past two years. He's a technically sound but unathletic back who is the definition of competent backup. He will do nothing amazing, but nothing horrible. He received 121 underwhelming carries for 464 yards, three touchdowns, resulting in a 3.8 yards per carry average. Williams also can contribute in the passing game, seeing 41 targets, or 2.6 per game, with 
27 catches, 210 yards, and no touchdowns for a 66% catch rate. He'll likely see a reduced role if Jones stays healthy, finally, but he also has Dexter Williams nipping at his heels if history is trying to tell us that Jones can't handle the workload. Dexter Williams is 22 and was a Tier 3 running back for me and 19th overall back before the draft. The Packers took him with the 22nd pick of the 6th round, clearly towards the tail end of the draft. Williams is 5'11", 212 pounds, with 9.625 inch hands and a 76.875 inch wingspan. He's an explosive player as shown by his 36 inch vert, 130 inch broad jump, 7 second 3 cone drill, and 4.16 second 20 yard shuttle, but his 40 time was slower than I would have guessed at 4.57 seconds. On film, he does show the ability to break away. Dexter has spotty vision, is poor in pass protection, wastes too much movement in the backfield, struggles to move side to side when he's not up to speed, doesn't protect the ball well, doesn't show many moves, displays lazy tendencies on film, and has below average contact balance. The Packers drafted him as a project slash change of pace player in the event of another Jones injury, as he does show much better long speed on film than the combine. Williams can catch and has adequate power and does show some nice athletic traits at times. He's someone that I don't see overtaking even Jamal Williams anytime soon and I won't be owning him on any of my teams as I predict it's going to take a long time for him to pay off and his overall lack of football intelligence, moves, and vision as a ball carrier. Aaron Rodgers and the passing offense. Rodgers is entering his 15th season and will be 36 years old at season's end and was the 24th overall selection of the 2005 draft. He threw for 4,442 yards and 25 touchdowns last year with a 98 passer rating and just two interceptions. Rodgers is always in risk for injury. He played through a grade 2 MCL sprain and bone bruise just last season but also has a collarbone fracture in 2017 another collarbone fracture in 13, three concussions, and a 2006 foot fracture when he was still a backup. Over the 11 years he started, Rodgers averages 4,294 yards, 34 touchdowns, and a 103 passer rating each year after you adjust for injuries. He's always preferred timing throws, especially back shoulder balls, and only has a few years with an above average fantasy tight end. That being said, he hasn't really had much talent at the tight end position either, as the Packers have typically gambled on aging veterans with injury risk, like Jimmy Graham. One of the best QBs to ever play from a skill standpoint, he's now entering a new offense but is virtually guaranteed to throw for 30 or more touchdowns without an injury stopping him. If the second-year receivers we previously talked about can step up at all, another 4,000 passing, 35-plus touchdown campaign is in the cards for Rodgers. Last year, the Packers were 9th in pass yards per game, but 14th in points per game, while also being 3rd in the league in passing attempts per game. The offensive line was 21st in pass protection, 7th in creating yards for the running back, 21st in power success rate, top half in two of the other run metrics I look at, and bottom half in the last run metric. They added a second round center in Elgton Jenkins and a replacement level guard in Billy Turner, formerly of the Broncos. They added only one undrafted free agent to the group, so I don't see any reason for this unit to improve or degrade significantly this upcoming year. The overall offense was 12th in yards per drive, 16th in points per drive, 18th in time of possession per drive, and were the second most pass-happy team in the NFL with only 34.2% of their plays being a run. With a new head coach that reportedly plans to emphasize the run and did so in Tennessee last year, the run call percentage is almost guaranteed to increase. The Packers' defense was 18th in yards allowed per game last year, 10th to last in points allowed per game, 10th to last in rushing yards allowed per game, and 12th in pass yards allowed per game with a 6-9-1 record. The Packers invested heavily in defense during the offseason, adding defensive end Zadarius Smith from Baltimore, edge rusher Preston Smith from Washington, and safety Adrian Amos from Chicago. The Pack also hammered the draft on defense, selecting 
drafting Rashawn Gary, defensive end from Michigan at 12th overall, and strong safety Darnell Savage at 21st overall. Additionally, three fifth round or later defenders were added, along with five undrafted free agents. They lost only Clay Matthews, HaHa Clinton Dix, and Nick Perry to free agency, and I expect this unit to improve in 2019 if they can remain healthy. A more run-heavy approach will also increase the offensive time of possession, resting the defense, and limiting the opponent's chances to score. The reason for the probable increase in run call percentage is head coach Matt LaFleur, who is 39, and the former offensive coordinator of the Rams in 2017, and then the Titans in 2018. Both seasons, his teams ranked in the top 10 in both rushing attempts and rushing yards, and while this may decrease some with the presence of Aaron Rodgers, LaFleur clearly believes in the run as a key component of the offense. With a career completely based on the offensive side of the football, with eight years as a quarterback's coach, this hire is a good sign for Rodgers also. Don't let the run-first philosophy scare you off of one of the most talented quarterbacks of all time. Growing pains could rear their heads with this being LaFleur's first time as a head coach, but retaining defensive coordinator Mike Bettine could help with continuity in scheme on defense. Now let's talk about who Jay Sternberger is as a football player. He's my pre-draft tight end 5 and the highest ranked of the tier 2 tight ends. He's 6 foot 4, 251 pounds with 9.75 inch hands and a 77.25 inch wingspan. He's older for this class at 22.93 years old with above average weight divided by height, a below average span divided by height, and an average hand size divided by height. He ran a slightly below average 4.7540 at his combine. His his 31.5 inch vertical was also below average as well as his 113 inch broad jump and 7.19 second three cone. He did have an average 4.31 second 20 yard shuttle and 17 bench reps but overall was a disappointing combine compared to the rest of the class. Sternberger did show some positive traits on film, like being a hands catcher with nice bursts after the catch, great head fakes on his routes when he does decide to use them, he's much better off the ball as a receiver than in a tight end stance, which you could take as good or bad, he has decent speed, adjusts to jump balls pretty well, pretty good shoulder angle on his seal blocks, remember that means what angle, if I draw a line between my two shoulders, what angle does that line make with the line of scrimmage on seal blocks you want that to almost be 90 degrees so he's pretty good there he doesn't take a false step as a wide receiver usually he can make a contested catch when he's about to receive a hit he has decent contact balance and balance in general decent agility he does effectively block his man at times he will use a stiff arm effectively and has decent vision as a ball carrier Sternberger does display some negative traits on film as well. Sternberger is slow out of his stance as a tight end. He pushes defenders instead of blocking them. He fails to adjust quickly to off-target throws. He's poor in pass protection due to -to side-to-side agility issues. He overruns blocks on the second level due to the same. He doesn't deliver the blow, but absorbs contact instead. He has strength issues. He's poor at avoiding rerouting defenders. Has issues with running routes. Has poor awareness as a blocker, both in the run game and in pass protection, doesn't block for his teammates after the catch, doesn't use physicality to get separation at his route breaks, and he consistently fails to get separation at his route breaks using any method, either physicality, athleticism, or route running. He consistently gets driven back by defensive linemen, he has poor technique and inconsistent effort as a blocker, he will completely avoid hitting defenders he's supposed to block out of a fear of contact, I worry about his ball security after the catch, and over overall seems scared and hesitant of physicality. He also shows a poor knowledge of route concepts, possesses no special athletic traits, and he still shows that he will drop the ball. So where do we draft Sternberger in our Dynasty Rookie Drafts? Well, right now, he's consistently being taken as the fourth tight end off the board with an average draft position of 25. I find this ridiculously high and believe it's only due to name recognition than people actually watching the film, which shouldn't be a shock to anyone. Most people don't watch the film. Those that do usually can't actually dissect what they're seeing. Those are just facts. If that offends you, I don't know 
the fuck to tell you. Some things are just facts, and if it offends you, that's not on me, that's on you. I would much rather have Kahali Waring later in the draft, which everyone should know by now how much I like him. I don't see any special athletic traits with Sternberger. I don't see blocking ability that's going to keep him on the field for more snaps, which equals more opportunities. I don't see technical skill as a receiver or good overall football intelligence. He's also behind Jimmy Graham for at least one year, which is wasting a roster spot on your team for that entire time frame. And then he has to compete with a tight end that may be a better pass catcher and blocker in Robert Tunyon. Tunyon also has better athletic ability, running a 4.6340 at worst out of college, a 38-inch vertical, and almost certainly better numbers in general when it comes to testing. He's also got more years in the NFL than Sternberger. And I think most people know or believe in the adage that tight ends take a while to make an impact in the NFL. I think way too many people believe this to always be true without actually analyzing the tight ends for what they can do, but I digress. Robert Tunyon was undrafted, so I'm not predicting that he dominates Sternberger or completely takes over the job next year after Jimmy Graham likely leaves, but I do think it's a very strong possibility that they at least split time, especially if Sternberger doesn't vastly improve as a blocker. Rodgers also has never historically overutilized his tight end, but that doesn't say that he couldn't if he does have an adequate talent. But Sternberger simply isn't ready right now, either as a blocker or a receiver, to contribute this season. He was selected 75th overall in the third round, which is positive draft capital, but due to the opportunity cost of that bench spot for at least an entire season, and the tight ends that are currently ahead of him in Green Bay, I'd much rather use my draft pick on Kahali Waring, Dawson Knox, or even Josh Oliver, who can't block at all just for immediate opportunity's sake. I don't hate the player, but right now he's my pick for most overrated tight end outside of TJ Hawkinson. On Tuesday, we'll be going over Daryl Henderson of the Rams, and Wednesday will be a breakdown of the Arizona Cardinals while also talking about their new rookies as we go. I know this was supposed to be last week, but it was kind of hard to type up my notes or record when I couldn't sit up, so hopefully that is an excuse that you will accept. The songs of the day today, your happy song is Family Business by Kanye West, and your football song is Don't Push Me by 50 Cent, Lloyd Banks, and Eminem. As always, those links are in the episode description. Thanks to everyone for listening and opening your mind to an alternative point of view to evaluating Dynasty rookies and Dynasty theory overall. I know I place a heavy emphasis on immediate production, but I also believe you should be trying to compete every single year and trying to maximize every single roster spot you have at all times. That leads me to value different traits over other people because they're looking for long-term production where I find that to be vastly overrated. Short-term, immediate production helps your team the most right now. If you want to win championships, you need to get out of the tanking mindset and get into the compete now, win now mindset. If you feel anything in today's episode has been worth your time, worth $1 of saving you research, I would ask that you go to my Patreon and pledge $1. You You can always cancel after one month so that you never are charged again. But this is how this podcast receives revenue. I'm not getting any ads. I'm not sponsored in any ways, as I believe that increases bias. I want to provide the most unbiased dynasty takes in the industry. I don't know if I'll reach that goal or not. What I do know is that I save time of researching all of the information that I do. If you want access to the paid content, that's $5 a month. It will definitely help you with your rookie drafts. And it's definitely not the consensus ranks that you probably see on every single free ranking site out there. So it's patreon.com slash 365 underscore dynasty. But now I'm going to digress into you get what you pay for. If you're following free rankings online, you're going to get the quality quality of return that free rankings provide. The reason I'm having a paid model from the get-go is because I truly believe and have proved to myself with results that my rankings are worth more than the free rankings out there. What they do is they have good free rankings for a year, maybe two years, and then they switch over to a paid model and now they have zero fucking incentive to provide good rankings because they just got your money. I believe in my process. I believe in my product. 
Nothing's perfect right now. I'm a one-man crew, but you get what you pay for. I firmly believe that if you really don't know what you're doing in Dynasty right now, and you pay $5 and screenshot my links and unsubscribe, those 5 bucks are going to help you have a chance to win your Dynasty League prize at some point in the next year or two, far more than any free rankings you could find. When you listen to the popular consensus and the popular opinion, you fall victim to the biases that group mentality creates. They have a need to find the number one player, the 1.01. This year, it's either Josh Jacobs or Nikhil Harry. I think both of them are no better than the players at pick 25 in this year's draft. I don't think there's any difference in their odds, their talent level, anything, than the top 25 to 30 players in this draft this year. But people find a need to all agree on one player. It's just ridiculous to me. But anyways, I guess that's all I want to say is I know I'm providing value. I'm not sure how it's being received on your end, but just based on the amount of time I save you in researching this shit, I would think throwing one buck my way for a month would be a nice gesture of you're heading the right direction. If you have any specific feedback, again, email me at bubba at dynasty-365.com or reach out to me on one of my social media platforms. If you'd like to try your hand at writing Dynasty articles, reach out to me via one of those methods as well. Email will be the most effective. My only requirement is that you have your own opinion and don't listen to consensus. After that rant, I feel a need to thank you for listening again. You've been listening to Dynasty 365, where the film will set you free. Everything is confusing. You will be good.